Monday we, we managed to have a little bit of a family emergency, so we had to miss that session, but I'll redo, we'll do the lecture, well, we're doing Monday's lecture today, and we'll do uh, Thursday's lecture on Monday, but you should be able to still tackle most of the quiz, but I'll extend the deadline a little bit so you've got more time. Um, and you should be able to do the tutorial tomorrow without any, any extra information. So, as we said, this is the final topic of the module of the course, is attitude, determination, and control. Um, so what we're hopefully going to address in this is you should be able to describe some of the key requirements and methods of space systems, attitude, determination, and control systems. We call it ADCS because it's a bit of a mouthful saying attitude, determination, and control all the time. So if I say ADCS, hopefully you know what that means now. Uh, we use uh, some basic analytical methods to sort of determine some of the torque requirements for an attitude control system. And you should be able to describe some of the key features and basic operational principles of ADCS technologies, okay? So we'll look at the technologies on Monday. Hopefully we'll get through most of the, the sort of theoretical stuff of how we um, determine torques and what, what the control systems are all, all about. So what we're hopefully going to cover today is attitude control system requirements, why we need attitude control, what sort of disturbance torques our satellites might be subjected to, so what sort of torques do our, our attitude control systems need to be able to react to, um, on how we start to estimate the torque requirements for these systems. And then we'll look hopefully on Monday about attitude determination hardware and attitude control. So here's a, a kind of diagram of a typical um, flow of uh, attitude control system. So you might have some disturbances, which are external to your spacecraft, and they put some torques on your spacecraft, so they start spinning your spacecraft. Um, your spacecraft then needs to know what its attitude is, so it needs some sensors to be able to identify what the attitude is. Those are these attitude sensors. It might send that data down to ground control, so ground control knows what the attitude of the spacecraft is. But it would also send it to the onboard computer, so the onboard computer knows what the attitude is. So it can do things autonomously as well as being controlled. Um, then the ground control may send some signals up to the onboard computer to say what the spacecraft needs to do if it's in a particular orientation or attitude or condition. And that might send some torque demands to your control talkers. So these are devices, hard pieces of hardware on board the satellite that will allow you to control or manage that torque, that's on the, on, manage the momentum on the spacecraft, and be able to address if the spacecraft is spinning, be able to de-spin it, or if the spacecraft needs to be repointed or reorientated, be able to do that. So all of these conditions. So there's various operations where, where the satellite um, ADCS needs to kick in, uh, certainly in orbit insertion, once uh, the satellite comes out of a launch vehicle, it often has what we call a tip rate or a spin associated with that. That's just from the launcher, it just has a little, little spin and then you have to de-spin de the satellite to be able to acquire a signal initially. So if you've got a beacon on your board your satellite and it's spinning around, it's pointing in one particular direction, you need to try and de-spin the satellite to get that beacon pointing towards the ground. Had a little question? Yeah. Yeah, so there'll be what well, we, we call it tip rates or spin. Well, so a spin associated with the fact that it's sliding out of a launch rail perhaps and it's got a little bit of torque, torque given to it when it slides out, so that gives it a little bit of a spin. Um, you also need uh, the ADCS to determine the attitude, to acquire the attitude initially, to do some sort of station keeping when you're on mission, to be able to keep the satellite within its... Uh, re controlled requirements, to do what we call slew maneuvers. So a slew is where we change the angle of the uh, uh, orientation of the satellite. So that might be something like the Hubble, does quite a lot of slew maneuvers, um, because it's pointing at one constellation or one area of the sky, and then it might needs to repoint, so it needs to do a maneuver in order to do that. It has to have some sort of system on board to be able to allow the spacecraft to completely repoint. And then it may be for critical operation modes to keep um, the spacecraft, making sure the spacecraft is pointing in a particular direction. So, as we say, ADCS requirements are to be able to orientate the spacecraft, 
to be able to stabilize a spacecraft, make sure it's, if, it's, if these torques are acting on it, that it, it, it is stable, it is pointing in a particular direction, and to manage all of this angular momentum that's, that's happening with the spacecraft so, so that that um, is under control. So have we got any questions around that? They're all fairly straightforward. Are you happy with that? Okay. So in terms of our payload, our, our attitude control system, we have potentially requirements from the payload. So it might be that the payload has a particular item that needs to be pointed. It could be the whole payload, or it could just be a specific item. So there could be a bit on the spacecraft that just moves, and the rest of the spacecraft may may spin or, or that, or we keep it one bit stationary. So there could be a separation of spins in the satellite or um, a requirement from, from the payload side. There may be a pointing direction requirement for, for a payload. So a particular example might be for an Earth observation satellite. The camera would need to point towards the ground, point towards nadir. Okay. Or if, you're, if you've got a satellite that's observing the sun or observing something else, it would have to have a requirement to keep the satellite pointing, the payload pointing in that direction, um, and pointing relative to some baseline. There may be a pointing range, so the range where it's able to point. So um, again, if it's um, sort of Earth observation, you may be able to want to um, move that satellite across a sort of swath, so it's going backwards and forwards, so you're able to cover more of the surface with just a single sensor. Uh, you might have some sort of pointing accuracy, um, and, and this might be a requirement in order to sort of make sure you're, you're uh, looking at a particular point on the Earth's surface, or your communication systems are pointing in the right direction, or some, something like that, and there, there needs to be some sort of control around that, so it will provide some sort of absolute angular control requirement. Uh, you'll have to have some sort of pointing knowledge. Um, it could be real time, during, maybe during communications link, so you make sure that your, your link is staying there, or after the fact, if you wanted to understand what the data that you got and where in the sky your, your spacecraft was pointing. Um, some sort of stability, so a maximum rate of change. Yeah, we've got a question. Oh, no, we wanted to say the response Okay. Um, uh, a slew rate, so that's the time to reorientate the spacecraft. And there might be exclusion zones. So if you have a very sensitive onboard sensor that can't point directly at the sun, there may be an exclusion zone that says it can't, it can't go within 10 degrees of the sun because that will blind or destroy your sensor. So there's things like that that are associated with the, with the payload. And other requirements may be related to sun pointing, so if your spacecraft needs to generate power from the sun, then your solar panels need to be able to point to the sun, so your spacecraft needs to reorientate in certain um, positions around the orbit in order to do that, or to control the thermal environment on the spacecraft as well. Um, you might want to have pointing during a thrust maneuver, so, so that the thrusters are aligned with the velocity vector of the spacecraft, so that you're doing a maneuver or you're doing some sort of uh, cross vector burn, okay, so that in order to do some sort of control or guidance corrections. And again, I said about um, communications in the payload, because some satellites, the payload is communications, but all satellites have to have some sort of communication system to be able to communicate, so again, you might, you might have to do some sort of attitude maneuvers in order to, to do that and have the control. Oops, sorry, so any questions around any of that? So all, all fairly straightforward. Okay, so these, these are where we, what requirements we might have on our, our attitude control system. Um, so get, going back into looking at how we start defining what we need to use our a, a set of datums or axes um, that we will use to define our attitudes. So very similar to aircraft, we have yaw, which is usually about the z-axis, we have pitch, which is usually about the y-axis, and we have roll, which is usually about the x-axis. Which spacecraft has your pitch and roll? It's sort of a little less intuitive in a spacecraft than it is 
in an aircraft, because aircraft have wings, so you can kind of think, think where is the yaw, pitch, and roll. You have to look at the spacecraft to understand in a little bit more depth where the yaw, pitch, and roll might be. But generally, our z-axis points to nadir, which is where the Earth is, if we're in an Earth-orbiting satellite, or where the, whatever planetary body you're orbiting is. So that's sort of straight down there. Yeah. And the x-axis usually points along the velocity vector. So if your orbit going around like this, then that's your x-axis. Or in this way, it's actually going that way. So the, your x-axis is pointing along that velocity vector. So any, any questions around that? It's fairly straightforward. You should have come across that in, uh, in your aircraft uh, sort of nomenclature. So it should be, should, be, should be very familiar to you. OK. So now we think about what sort of disturbance torques we might have on board, uh, acting on, on our spacecraft. Um, so these, these uh, forces can either be cyclic, so varying over an orbit, so have some sort of period associated with them, and it's changing over the orbit. Um, and generally, cyclic um, forces are kind of cancelling each other out over a single orbit period. So although we have to be aware of them and manage them in some respect, they also almost manage themselves in, in, in a, if, unless it's kind of um, the, the period is, is slightly varied from your orbit period. So, but generally, if, if it's sort of on, on par with your orbit period and it's fairly cyclic, um, it, they generally manage themselves. And we have secular, which are building up over time. And these are the ones where we really need to con consider and really need to con take care of, because if we allow these disturbance torques to build up over time, our spacecraft starts start spinning up, spinning up, and spinning up, and we need to have a way to de-spin it, manage that kind of um, torque that's acting on the spacecraft. Okay, so, so with, this, with the cyclic ones, it might spin up, and then in the next period, it's de-spinning itself, so it's naturally kind of managing that. There may be a little bit of variation, so you may get an overall general trend, and that's what we're seeing kind of here. And then when we, when we put this together, something that's cyclic and then that's something that's uh, varying, we get this. So we'll get some sort of general trend of spinning up, but over an orbit period, there may be a little bit sections of de-spin. Any, any questions around that? Fairly happy with that? Makes sense? OK, so the key disturbance torques, the key things that are providing disturbance to our spacecraft, are this aerodynamic drag. So we've come across that before, where aerodynamic drag is taking energy away from our spacecraft, and it's causing our spacecraft orbit to decay. But aerodynamic drag also acts as a moment on our spacecraft and provides a torque that might start spinning our spacecraft. So depending on where the center of pressure is in relation to the center of mass, we'll have a moment acting on our spacecraft, so we need to consider that. The same with solar radiation pressure. We'll still have some, some effects of torques acting. Gravity gradient as well, that has an impact. So if we have very long spacecraft acting in, in the gravitational field, that will start to create um, torques. And the magnetic field as well. So if our space, all spacecraft have electrical components, and, that, and because of that, they have an associated, what we call, magnetic dipole. They're effectively like a little magnet. And that will orientate themselves in a magnetic field. And the Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field, and that causes a torque on our spacecraft. Okay, so, so generally we can manage it, but, yep. So, so the spacecraft has a very weak, what we call, magnetic dipole. So it acts very much like a magnet in a, in a, a magnetic field. And it will, it will turn according to the orientation of the magnetic field. So it will be kind of moving within that magnetic field, which is creating a torque on the spacecraft. And if, we, if it's turning in a way we don't want it to turn, we've got to then add some sort of counter torque into that to manage that. Yeah, so, so in a cyclic um, uh, the forces, we get something that spins the satellite up a little bit, and then it's, it acts in the opposite direction, so it kind of takes that spin away. But it might not do that purely in a, exactly the same, so there will still be like a residual 
spin in one particular axis. So we have to manage that, but over an orbital period, it may be able to self-manage the, the large proportion of the torques. Okay? Some good questions going on for 9 o'clock. So are we all happy with that? Yeah. Okay, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about the aerodynamic drag. So we can work out the aerodynamic force on, a, on our satellite. And it's very similar to aerodynamic force on, a, on an aircraft. You've come across this equation before, a half rho v squared. Yep. A few nods. Okay. Yeah, should be familiar to you now. So we've got then the area of the satellite presented and then the coefficient of drag. Okay, so for satellites, um, the coefficient of drag is quite challenging to... to uh, measure. We can't really stick a satellite in a wind tunnel and measure the drag coefficient. Uh, but we have a good estimate because the drag is coming from rarefied flow, so it's basically like a whole lot of billiard balls hitting against the surface of the satellite. We can look statistically and we can use simulation tools, what we call Monte Carlo simulation, to look at how that geometry is influenced. But we can also get very basic analytical kind of approximations. Um, generally, we take the spacecraft. CD to be around 2 or 2.2. You'll see in most uh, kind of, it's a good first order of magnitude kind of estimation of, of CD. Um, if you want to look more in more depth, there's sort of a range between, anywhere between 1 and 4 that, that CD usually lies. But um, you, generally we see it sort of around 2 or 2.2. And what we see happening, sorry, is our spacecraft drag is, is usually against the velocity vector. So what that does is that winds down our spacecraft orbit. It takes energy out of our spacecraft. Okay, so we've looked at that before. As a torque, right, so we will have the center of mass of our spacecraft and some sort of center of pressure. And so if the center of pressure isn't at the center of mass, then we're going to have a torque acting. The center of pressure is where that force, that aerodynamic force is acting through. And that's going to create a torque on our spacecraft. It's going to start to spin our spacecraft. In this case, we could add another solar panel out the other side, and that would probably bring our center of aerodynamic pressure into the middle. So we could manage it by the geometry of our satellite. But it may be the orientation of our satellite has an influence as well of where that center of pressure is going to be. So it might not be as simple as just changing the geometry in order to do that. But we can work out the torque on the spacecraft by, if we have an estimate of where the center of pressure is, where the center of mass is, and what that aerodynamic force is. Some of the key characteristics are uh, the, the aerodynamic drag is, tends to be constant if the spacecraft is pointing towards the Earth. Um, it tends to be variable if the spacecraft is pointing at some distant star, some fixed, um, it, so it's in what we call inertially fixed, so it's pointing at some distant location where it's generally not moving within its frame of view. And it's, it's influenced by altitude, because that's the, the density, it's influenced by spacecraft geometry. So any, any questions around that? That's fairly, fairly straightforward, a bit familiar because you've done a lot of uh, aerodynamics before. So. Okay, solar radiation pressure is sort of similar. Okay, so like aer uh, the rarefied atmosphere, you've got lots of, effectively lots of molecules hitting the surface. Solar radiation pressure, you've got photons hitting the surface, imparting energy, um, and that creates a sort of force on, on the spacecraft. Um, again, that's acting in the direction of the solar radiation, so, so the sun. Okay, so that solar radiation is coming from the sun, um, and it can either speed up or slow down depending on the orientation. We can work out the force. So the force is related to the solar output, so QS. We came across when we were looking at the thermal control um, and the speed of light. Okay, so that's the energies in the, in the photon. The area that's exposed and how reflective your surface is, and then what's the incident angle between the sun and that surface as well. And what this tends to do over a period of time is because you've got uh, this um, acting against the orbital velocity at this point and acting with the orbital velocity at this point, it starts to make your orbit more eccentric over a period. So where the drag starts to take energy out and actually circularize your orbit if you've got a very eccentric orbit or take, um, reduce the orbital altitude 
the solar radiation pressure tends to act to actually increase the eccentricity of your orbit. When we want to calculate torque, it's very similar to the way we calculate torque for um, the aircraft uh, drag, the spacecraft drag. So we've got that force that we've calculated here. And then again, we need to know where our center of mass is in relation to our center of solar radiation pressure. This might be slightly different to our center of pressure, aerodynamic pressure, because it depends on the material properties of reflectivity. So it depends on how reflective various surfaces are, where that concentrate of that force will be, so where the, the force will be considered to be acting through. If we sum all of the little forces that are acting all over the spacecraft um, and the, the, the predominant force where it's acting through. So some of the key characteristics here are it's cyclic if we're pointing to, towards the Earth, to nadir pointing. It's constant if the spacecraft is pointing towards the sun, it makes sense. And then it's also influenced by spacecraft geometry, as with the aerodynamic, and surface reflectivity in that center of mass. Okay. Any, any questions around that? I'm fairly happy. Okay. So the next one is magnetic field. Okay. So as I said, our spacecraft, or our Earth, is effectively a bar magnet, and it has these uh, magnetic field lines acting around it and our spacecraft is sitting in that magnetic field. We can work out the local magnetic flux density of the Earth, where Me is with a magnetic moment of the Earth, and that's a constant, and R is the local radius of the orbit. So you can see that that magnetic flux density is changing as we're going higher and higher in orbital altitude. Lambda is some sort of parameter that scales um, depending on whether you're at the equator or at the poles, because you can see um, if we're equatorial, our field is quite different from when we're at the poles. And at the poles, remember when we looked at um, our atmosphere, that's where all of those charged particles get drawn in, and you see the aurora borealis or the aurora, um, uh, oh, what's, it? what's this other one? Aurora Australia. Australia, yes, that's the one. Wait, so, the Yes, and interacting with our atmosphere and, and the, um, the, uh, the constituents of the, the molecules within our atmosphere, and that causes those lovely colors and dancing lights that you see. In, mostly you see pictures from the northern uh, hemisphere, because I think the aurora australialis, there's not many people that go down to the South Pole and be able to observe those. Okay, so torque, then, is estimated by, as I said, our spacecraft also acts like a little bit of a magnet. Okay, you've got electrical components, you've got things going on inside the spacecraft, currents being moved around the spacecraft, and um, uh, aluminium and other components in there that, ha that sh will create this sort of magnetic field. Okay, so, so that's if you've got induced current in, in aluminium, that creates an electromagnetic field around the spacecraft as well. So all these sort of things tend to provide the spacecraft with what we call a dipole, okay? A magnetic dipole, it acts a little bit like a bar magnet. And if we work, we can work out the torque acting on the spacecraft by um, multiplying the dipole moment by this uh, magnetic field, that's local magnetic flux density, that we can estimate depending on the altitude and whether or not we're at uh, the poles or closer to the equator. That changes that lambda m component. So does that sort of make sense to everyone? Kind of happy with that? Wait, wait, what's DP exactly? So it's the dipole moment of the spacecraft. So it's something you would have to measure potentially in a lab, um, but you could look at similar spacecraft and see, well, what's, that's got similar equipment on board, a similar size, so it's going to have a rough, if you were doing some um, sizing or estimate calculations, you would look at similar spacecraft to see what their dipole moments were, what they were estimated as. You could, you could start to kind of look at the first order and what, what those moments might be on, on the spacecraft you're designing. What's B? B is the local magnetic flux density. So it's telling you about what this magnetic field around the Earth is, is but locally. Because you can see it's changing quite significantly from the poles to the equators. Yep. Uh, dipole moment, I think, is in ampere hours, is it? Um, I, I've put the, the certainly the, the um, 
The units are in the, in the course notes, but I think it's on per hours. Um, and B is in Tesla meter cubed per meter cubed. Um, I'm looking at Ben because he probably got the course notes open and could, could correct me or lecture notes. Okay. <laughs> but the, the actual units for, for a dipole moment, I think is, yeah, ampere, could be ampere per meter cubed or something like that. Yeah. Um, and the key characteristics, so it's generally cyclic. So you can see if you're going around in this magnetic field, it's kind of correcting itself, so you shouldn't have to worry too much. But if it's moving, if the spacecraft is moving locally in an orientation you don't want it to move, you then may have to correct it. And it's influ influenced by spacecraft altitude, that residual dipole, and the orbital inclination as well. So it depends on whether you're near the equator or the poles, how, what that influence of that might be. Okay, oh, do we have any further questions about that? We're kind of fairly happy. It just envisages the spacecraft acting like a bar magnet within this magnetic field and it's going to try and orientate itself. And then we have uh, the gravity gradient. Um, so if your spacecraft is particularly long, so there's a diagram here of the spacecraft, um, it's trying to be long, so it's trying to use the gravity, effect of gravity gradient to actually orientate the spacecraft in that kind of gravity field. Um, so we have a force that's acting, mu is the gravitational parameter, and r is the local radius of the orbit. So if r is changing over, over the, um, significantly or relatively significantly over the geometry of that satellite, then you can have a moment that acts on that satellite to actually orientate that satellite within the gravity field. And that creates a torque. So the torque is related to your moments of inertia. Typically, you're a Z. And if your satellite is nicely cubic like this, then the Y and the X axis moments of inertia are relatively similar. And so this, the spacecraft will usually just orientate itself to the long axis pointing towards the Earth. So that torque is acting to kind of orientate the spacecraft in that direction. And that allows you, if you wanted to, to have some sort of control over the spacecraft's attitude. You could change the geometry of the spacecraft to actually create that torque um, and control that. So key characteristics here are, it's obviously going to be constant if your spacecraft is Earth pointing. So if you wanted your spacecraft to be Earth pointing, if it was a telescope, you could actually, would be very advantageous. You could put the telescope pointing in this direction, nice long uh, for your kind of optical access. And that gives you also an orientation and like, control. Uh, it's, Cyclic, though, if it's a fixed inertially. So if you're looking at some far distant position, some far away, some stars in the background, then it's going to change as you're moving around locally in that gravitational field of the Earth. Um, and so that's going to have to, you're going to have to be able to counter that. It's influenced by your spacecraft inertias. So you've come across inertia before, mass moment of inertia. In maths, in dynamics, I think you've probably done that. So it's influenced by where the masses are in relation to the geometry of the spacecraft. So if you've got a mass very far out, you're going to have quite high inertia. If you pull the mass all the way into the center, it's going to reduce. That's why you see, I don't know if anyone's seen ice skaters, where they, they stick their hands out at the beginning of a spin, and then they pull it in to spin faster, because they're reducing their moment of inertia by pulling their arms in, and that makes them spin up faster, and then they can control that. You can do that with a spacecraft as well. So if you had booms that could move out and move in, you could change uh, that moment of inertia of the spacecraft, where the mass is situated in relation to the datum to the center of mass. And it's also related to altitude because of the, uh, the orbital radius and the, the um, gravitational parameter, gravitational force. As well. So any, any questions around that? We're fairly happy? Yeah? Okay. So how then do we stabilize our spacecraft? We talked about, um, we've kind of hinted about various methods. You've had a little bit of experience with the spinning tops. You might have an inclination of what that might be used for. Uh, one of the main types of stabilization, or initial types of stabilization for very simple satellites, is what we call spin stabilize. What you, uh, this is effectively like our little uh, spinning tops. We're using the gyroscopic effect the fact that our spacecraft, if we spin it, acts a bit like a gyroscope and it keeps one axis in an orientation as an advantageous 
effect. Okay, so we're using that to keep our attitude. We spin our spacecraft up. So it's very simple, cost effective. We don't need any other systems on board other than the fact that we spin our spacecraft initially and make sure we can keep that spin going. We use this, what we call gyroscopic rigidity. So that's what, what happens when we spin our little spinning tops up, why they don't fall over with gravity for acting on them. They're actually acting against that gravity, that gyroscopic force is acting against the frictional force at the base and acting against the gravitational force over the mass of the object. And it gives our spacecraft what we call whoop, sorry, momentum bias. Generally, the spin should be in, uh, axis should be in a direction that's not going to change during the mission. So if your spacecraft is an Earth observation satellite, you probably have the spin axis on that Z axis, nadir pointing, and you probably have some sort of uh, sensors on board that could, uh, so, so an image sensor, and you'd have to then compensate for that, um, the spin in, that, in, the, in the data you get from that image sensor, spinning around, okay? You might want a de-spin sensor itself, or you might just want to do some compensation. Spin axis is generally around um, a mass symmetry axis. So you can see our spinners spin nicely if they're, they're sort of, uh, they're, they're nicely symmetric about their spin axis. If we started adding mass, and you can try that at home if you want to, you're allowed to take these all with you. So you could start adding little bits of mass and on the edges of the spinner and to see at various locations, see what that does to the spin. It's gonna start wobbling it a little bit. No longer be nicely, um, spinning on one axis. And we have the other type of, of general stabilization, is what we call three axis stabilizers. This is where we've got control over all three axes. And so we might use spin uh, momentum wheels or um, uh, um, some sort of spinning wheels to provide that control. Okay, so similar to a spinner, we're managing the torque, but we're managing it internally, okay? So that torque is being absorbed by these momentum or these reaction wheels. Um, and so the reaction wheels actually control the attitude, and momentum wheels manage the torque. So take out the torque and transfer it into, into the momentum wheel. It's very complex and expensive. So you only see sort of large, expensive satellites might use these. It allows us to maneuver in all three axes, which is good. If we need that, so if we needed to be able to reorientate the satellite, the solar rays to point to the sun and then satellite to point down to the Earth or to point to stars or point whatever it's doing. We might have, we need to have momentum wheel on pitch axis to provide some sort of momentum bias. Um, so that could be a big wheel that's spinning on its pitch axis and that, that gives it a sort of internal gyroscopic rigidity so it doesn't, that pitch axis doesn't change. Or a reaction wheel on each axis to provide um, zero momentum. So that's where we will put some energy into those reaction wheels and spin up to kind of orientate the satellite or take, um, take away the torques that are acting on the satellite to control it. Any questions around that? We're fairly happy? Okay. So this gets back to our question of angular momentum. Um, so is, are you all familiar with left hand rule? Yeah? So similar to uh, the electromotive forces with the left hand rule or right hand rule, I can't remember, one or the other. Uh, left hand rule is telling you about, so we've got our mass times the velocity on one angle, on one axis. And if we do the cross product of that and the radius, then we get the angular momentum, angular momentum vector. Okay, so we can see it's, it's normal to that velocity. So when we're spinning our top, We've got some velocity acting in this direction. Um, and then we've got the radius in this direction, which gives us a normal moment acting, angular momentum acting along this axis, which keeps that up, spinning top upright. Okay? So R and V are relative to O, and O is this point, this datum point here. Okay, so if we have a body that's complex, so it's very simple, that body, but if we have a quite a complex geometry, then we need to consider uh, the mass moment of inertia. So not just, it's not just a lumped mass anymore, we need to consider where, how that mass is distributed around that spacecraft. Um, and 
omega here is our spin axis, and then um, if we multiply that by our mass moment of inertia, then we get our angular momentum vector. Okay, that's that direction there. And our inertia matrix is basically telling us where our mass is sitting in relation to um, the geometry of our spacecraft, so giving us our mass moments of inertia. Any questions on that? Yep. So this, so this matrix tells us, tells us where our mass is sitting relative to what exactly? To, well, the, it's the mass moments of inertia, so it's telling you where the mass is in relation to the sort of geometry of the spacecraft. So if we have an instrument that's very heavy and it's sitting out in one corner of our spacecraft, then we're going to have, depending on what axis it's sitting on, a high, uh, it could be quite a high um, value for I, XX in one part, um, and then zero somewhere else, so maybe AI, uh, ZZ is, is zero or very low. And so that's going to change the sort of geometry where bits of components are sitting in relation to the center of mass and the center of, of and our geometry, our satellite. So it's like this case where if you're uh, trying to do a, a, a pirouette and you're an ice skater, first of all, you start off with your hands out wide, and your spin is slower. And then if you want to increase your spin, you change your mass moment of inertia. You're pulling that mass in closer to your spin axis. That's changing the moment of inertia of your, of your uh, body. It's changing the mass distribution. You haven't changed the mass. Mass is still the same. You're just changing the way that mass is distributed. Um, and changing the mass <coughs> moment of inertia. And that then changes your um, I overall, which will change your spin and give you a higher angular momentum. OK, so physically, the angular momentum of a rigid body, it's a measure of the, the torque impulse needed to create this rotational moment. So we've got these torques acting. Um, and angular momentum can then be changed if we apply an external force, okay? So we can change it, we can damp things by having these internal um, reaction wheels or momentum wheels. So we can, we can use that for a short period of time to take out some of that momentum on the entire spacecraft and put it into the reaction wheel. But then we would need to desaturate that reaction wheel over time, or that momentum wheel over time because it's going to build up all of those torques. The only way to do that is to have some sort of external device acting or external force acting on the spacecraft. Where do you think these external forces might come from? How can we exert an external torque on the spacecraft? What forces can we act on the spacecraft externally? Yeah? Okay, th those are the ones we, yeah, that are acting naturally on our spacecraft. Um, those are ones we probably want to be counteracting, so, so we, we could use them, so we could potentially use a magnetic field, and we could change the dipole moments, and that might change. So a magnetic, mag magnetorker, which we'll look at on Monday, is a way of doing that. Magnetorker. So it's, using, it's changing the mag basically the magnetic dipole moment of the spacecraft by having an uh, electromagnet in the spacecraft and you use that to orientate the spacecraft. Or we can also use thrusters. So thrusters that are offset from the center of mass will create a torque. And if we have a pair of them, then they will create a, uh, a moment on the satellite. And we can actually then apply a force and cause that moment. So we can start to create. The component of these external torques acting in the direction of the uh, uh, angular momentum vector uh, will only change the magnitude of that angular momentum. The component acting normally will change its direction. This is when you spin your top, you spun your little spinner, and you saw that it's sort of, sometimes it's not quite spinning purely, it's spinning a bit like a cone. Okay, and that's because you've got a little bit of friction acting normally to that axis, and that's changing that, the direction of that vector. Okay? So if we want to change the direction of angular momentum, um, so we need to provide a component of torque in a small time impulse. So, so that's or if we sum the torque over this little impulse, we get what the change is over that time. 
And if the magnitude stays constant, then we can get the change in angle, okay? So this is this torque force that's normal to our angular momentum vector. And if we change that, if, it stay, if that torque force remains relatively constant, we can start to see what that change in angle will be on our angular momentum vector. And that's what that precession is called, where we're, we're changing that orientation of that. Um, so, so basically the spin axis orientation, we can see uh, a little bit of precession. And this is what we call gyroscopic precession, okay? It's the angular momentum vector precessing, varying, um, depending on that sort of normal torque. So it's acting normally to the angular momentum vector. So as you see here, that's the angular momentum vector. And then this force that's acting normally to it causes this change, this delta phi, which causes this precession. Okay, as if we increase H, so if we make H really, really big, our angular momentum, we can do that either by increasing the spin rate, omega, or increasing the mass moment of inertia. And if we do either of those things, H will become bigger, and so it will be, the spacecraft will become more resistant to any little torques that are acting on it, any disturbance torques that are acting normally to that spin axis. So it becomes more and more resistant to change, and it gives us this, what we call, gyroscopic rigidity. Okay, so, so because it's spinning faster, or because it's got more mass moment of inertia, it then resists these forces acting, these torques acting against it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so our spacecraft now can, if we're using spin as a control, it can resist that. Or even if we have a, a wheel spinning inside, it's providing some gy gyroscopic rigidity. So. You, I mean, this is just showing you what your little spinners are doing, but on a video, for those of you not able to see uh, what I'm spinning in here, but you can see oh, very quickly. Right? It's a little bit of precession, yeah, because we've not got pure. Uh, this one's quite interesting. So it looks really counterintuitive against, but it's basically the, the gyroscopic effect which is keeping it. Okay, I couldn't get you very fancy gyroscopes, but I don't think you'll be able to get your little spinners to do that. But you can see how, how powerful using uh, these spinning wheels are. It's just kind of it's a very counterintuitive effect. Okay, it's just a mechanical components um, spinning, and we get this effect of of keeping an axis in one one orientation. So it's quite quite a useful. Yeah, so, so the, the gyroscope doesn't want to change its, its spin axis, so it's, it's kind of, it's, even though you've got the force of gravity acting on it, because it's spinning fast enough, it's not going to change. So in our spin-stabilized spacecraft, we might give our, our spacecraft momentum bias, this, this increase, uh, to be able to keep that gyroscopic rigidity. Uh, generally, we will choose the spin axis to be the direction um, that won't change during the mission, so it's orbit normal, typically, um, if, we're, if we're doing a spinner. So it, that constrains how we can kind of, what the geometry and, and how we can design spacecraft if we're using spin stabilization of spinning the entire spacecraft. Um, this angular momentum axis states is not necessarily uh, the same as the spin axis, okay, so these can diverge. Um, um, but generally, you want to choose what we call the principal axis. So this is the axis of symmetry of the mass. I'll show you in this next slide. Um, and generally, this for spinner spacecraft, this should be around the principal axis to spin. But I'll show you in this next slide what happens if you don't do that. So we've got various modes. We've got our pure rotation, which is hopefully what you get mostly when, when you spin your little spinners. But you might also get a little bit of coning. And that's where your spin axis sort of rotates. Um, around that moment of an uh, angular momentum axis H. So this is your spin axis here. And it's kind of going in a cone maneuver. I've got some little videos I can show you next. Or you've got nutation. And that's a weird one. It's where your spinner kind of does a little bit of a wibbly movement around. It's, very, it's, it's difficult to, to visualize. I've got a video which sort of shows it. But the only way you can really see it is kind of looking in a stroboscope to see kind of how that that's is moving or sort of tracing where 
the spacecraft axis goes, but it kind of makes a little sort of starry shape around. Okay, so you can see it's, it's sort of moving in between this cone and the bigger cone. So it's kind of wobbling in between the two of them. So you can see that's pure coning. Oh, is that pure rotation, sorry? That's coning. Okay, so some of you may be able to get these little spinners to cone. Um, and that is nutation, where you can see it's sort of wobbling quite a bit. Sorry, when I, when I put the, the spotlight on it, it freezes. But you can see it kind of, the bottom one is doing that nutation, where it's kind of wobbling around. And those are the general three types of motion that we get in, in spin space. We obviously want it only to do the, the pure rotation, because that's ideal. But you, you will enter into these other modes if you're not careful, and you need to manage that. Any questions around that? We're all fairly happy with that. OK. So for torque requirements, three axis stabilized space, stabilized space graph can maneuver and are kept um, kind of constant, these, these stabilized by these the three axes. It's very complex. It's very expensive. Um, but you've got two basic types, which I've hinted at before. One is where you provide some sort of momentum bias through a spinning wheel. So it's basically like you've got a gyroscope, or um, you provide gyroscopic rigidity. You've got some sort of gyroscope in the center of a spacecraft, but usually on your pitch axis. And that gives you some control over that axis. You'll still get torques acting on the others slightly, but you'll have a general axis that will be controlled. OK, so it's a bit like a spinner. But in this case, your spacecraft outer structure doesn't need to spin. So you can have a, a camera mounted to that that's pointing in a fixed direction. And you're basically using an internal gyroscope to provide that rigidity. Or you can have zero momentum, where you've got reaction wheels. So these are things that you spin up to react to or provide a, to a torque, or you're changing um, a torque on these axes. But you're cha effectively just changing the angular momentum. You're, you're kind of swapping it around the different axes. You can't completely remove all of the ang angular momentum without providing an external torque from a thruster or from sort of mag magna torque or from some, some sort of external force, maybe gravitational gradient or something else. That's the only way you can actually completely manage it um, in order to, to get rid of all the torques. You can, though, transfer torque from one axis to another using these different um, spinning wheels. As I said, both need external torques, such as thrusters or magnet torques, to control and manage that. So you can't just do away with this. Over time, your momentum will build up. Your momentum will still spin to a point where it needs what we call desaturation. You need to take momentum out of that wheel, and you need a, to provide an external torque on that. So you'll do what we call momentum dumping. So that's a maneuver where you apply thrust, or you apply a magnet torquer to get rid of the momentum in that momentum wheel and set it back to zero. Any questions around that? We've got two minutes left. So I'll try and get them through the next few slides. But we've done pretty well to get through most of this. Um, so this is most of the theory that you need and, and the sort of understanding you need to answer the tutorials tomorrow um, and the quiz as well. But if we want to estimate the torque requirements, um, we, we can use this equation here, well, we'll see. This is for looking at when we have torque, sorry, when our spacecraft um, is launched from a launch vehicle, as I said at the beginning, it has a little bit of spin associated with it. And that spin is called the tip off rate. So that's the, the spin that we get as the spacecraft exits the launch vehicle. Um, and so the initial maneuvers we need to do is to control that. So we, w we can work out based on what we know about the tip-off rate. So if you look in launcher manuals, they'll tell you what the tip-off rate will be for different launchers. Um, and we know what the, the moment of inertia of a spacecraft and the maximum, um, maximum angle that we were happy to accept our, our satellite will move into. And then we can control that. So we can apply a higher torque if we need to reduce that maximum angle. But it will then you can see if we're applying that, we'll reach that angle over time. Okay, So that's to prevent our spacecraft from spinning and moving away from the angle, the attitude angle that we require in order to get signal acquisition. That's very important. First thing when a spacecraft gets into orbit is you need to acquire signal. So you know what it's doing. You know everything's all happy and working on board. And you can start to control it. 
So ADCS, or Attitude Determination Control System, will stabilize the spacecraft with some sort of moment of inertia before it reaches this saturate, this angle that we don't want it to get too high above. Um, the other thing, other read area where we might want to estimate torque requirements is when we're doing a slew maneuver. So we might want to be able to reorientate our spacecraft ang angle, theta, to look from one set of stars to another set of stars, if it's like, like the Hubble Space Scope, or pointing on one part of the Earth to another. And the duration that we want to do this in might be the driver, so that T duration, time duration of the maneuver. So we might want to do it quickly if we're trying to take lots of images all over the, the sky, or we may have time to do that. And if we have time to do that, then our duration, T duration will be small, and our torque will be smaller. So we won't need as big a wheel, momentum wheel to do that, or reaction wheel to do that. But generally in these maneuvers, we will have a period where we have apply an accelerating torque to spin, to move, to start moving the spacecraft. And then because we're not got any reaction forces acting on that, there's no friction, there's no drag acting except aerodynamic drag if we're in low Earth orbit, there's nothing to slow it down. So we need to apply a decelerating torque to actually slow it down to stop it and create that change in, in orientation. Um, so those are the, sort of the typical areas where you would start to calculate these torque requirements. Um, we're finished for what we're covering today. And what we'll, we'll, we got through it all in good time. What we'll cover on Monday is all of the hardware that we need, that we need to do this. So I've hinted at some of the hardware, angular torquers um, and thrusters, but not about any of the determination, how we determine where our attitude is. We'll cover that all on Monday. But as I said, <laughs> sorry, if you can keep the noise down, let's laugh a little bit. As I said, we'll give you a little bit of extension on the tutorial questions, the quiz questions. Uh, and you should have most of the material for tutorial for five tomorrow, so you should be okay. if you want. Uh, early Christmas present. No, you, can, you can keep it if you want. <laughs> they are all very similar, but yeah, you're all welcome to have a spinning top and play with it at home. Use it as a, a relax, relaxation aid in your exam studies. Spin in, spin in top. <laughs> <laughs> Freebies always go down well. <laughs> Sorry? Not falling yeah. asleep is always a good sign. <laughs> 
on whether they're in a sports society or not. Yeah, which, let's be honest, engineers. <laughs> I was quite, I was the <laughs> old 